morning everyone um, and thank you for joining uh, we've got a great panel uh, set up today to discuss how we harness AI and when we talk about harnessing it, it's really around the regulatory frameworks that need to apply I think you know on reflection we all know that AI has been, has been around for many many years and um, even older than me but it's really about the the growth in computing power and the delay and the data collected from our the digital interactions and our digital footprints that means our machines are you know, really basic machines appear to be ever intelligent and then we look to you know to move towards facial recognition and even emotional recognition and my time at the the institute um we, we were struck for the, over the last couple of years and when we first started it we were struck about how ai really was seen as as how you build it into a country's industri industrial strategy. It's only over the last 12 to 18 months that the ethics debate has moved into the into proper substance around regulatory frameworks that should apply. And so our panelists today are going to draw out these points. Um, we do, we were, we, we were hope, we're hoping that Eva Kelly from um, the European Parliament will be able to join us at some point. But I, the, the plan is, is for the panellists to spend you know, three sentences introducing themselves, because I can't possibly do them justice, and then to spend five minutes on a question I pose for them, and then we can have questions at the end. Um, so the, the, our first panellist, looking at the new running order, is uh, Marco alexander Breit, the Head of Task Force for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Technologies the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Um, Marco, can you introduce yourself? And I know I posed you the question, how can regulators and legislators mitigate against the potential risks of AI, such as an unethical mm -hmm. bias and displacement of jobs? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Emma, and thank you all of you uh, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, my name is Marco Alexander Breit. I'm head of the task force Artificial Intelligence and Digital Technologies in the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. The digital technologies range from digital identities to open run and smart, smart services. So as you can see, it's pretty uh, it's a pretty wide array of digital technologies that um, we are responsible for. When it comes to AI, we do three things. We strategize AI, um, which means that we are one of the three ministries that are responsible in Germany for the national AI strategy, which is embedded in a European strategy. The second thing is um, Germany has decided to spend 5 billion um, on AI until 2025, and we are um, negotiating the package and we are distributing the money. And the third thing is we are responsible for some um, of the key parts um, of this national AI strategy and um, implementing them in the national economy and bringing AI from the research to the transfer and to the um, um, businesses, which means in the end that for us, the European approach, the twofold approach of the European Commission that we want to send, uh, set up and send an ecosystem of excellence and an ecosystem of trust is very vital. In the end, um, these two things in the day-to-day -day business, sometimes they collide, sometimes trust is in the way of excellence and sometimes excellence is in the way of trust. What do you mean by that? If you take into account, you said it already, facial recognition. If you want to be really, really good at facial recognition, you should actually have the opportunity to set it in motion, to implement it. But do we want this as Europeans? I don't know. So in the end, um, um, this is just this to be decided politically. I obviously have a position on that. But if you want to really get excellence, then we must, must be able to implement these technologies. This means that trust, which we actually want to foster, um, um, kind of collides at that point. Um, as of now, I think there is technology and technological um, um, implementations of AI that should be harnessed very, very harshly. That, for example, is um, facial recognition. That, for example, is uh, um, social scoring, especially when done by states. And thus, um, we are um, we are very happy with the European Commission's approach that wants to um, identify high risk high risk applications of AI and um, setting some very strong regulation um, on that part. On the other hand, the ecosystem of excellence of utmost importance. Why? Because the second part of the question, what, is, what does AI do to the jobs? 
And I am, for one, am not, um, I'm not keen to answer the question, what does AI do with certain jobs? And it should not be our responsibility to rescue each and every job from the impact of AI. What should be our responsibility as lawmakers, but as a government too, is to make sure that the new jobs that are generated by AI, the jobs that are changing by, by AI, and the jobs that are actually helped by AI are set in European Union, are set in Germany, are set in your nation states. Why is that so? Because these jobs, these economic growth is vital for our communities, it's vital for our social stability, and it's vital for our economic stability. Thus, the question we should answer is not, how do we deal with each and every job? It should be, how do we set in motion an ecosystem of innovation that thrives AI in the European Union, that thrives AI based on our values, as I mentioned before, and thus make sure that we will be one of the key players when it comes to AI and digital technologies in 2030, 2040, 2050, and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, Catherine, I'm Ca Catherine De Lorenzo, uh, Head of IP Data and Tech at Allen & Overy. Um, I, don't, I don't, you know, we'd had a, a good discussion around forecasting the scope and impact of the EU's new AI regulation. Would you like to introduce yourself and give some, some preliminary thoughts? Sure, happy to do that. So, um, my name is Catherine Di Lorenzo. Um, I'm heading the IP data and tech practice of Ellen Ovi in Luxembourg. Um, so, as the name of the team suggests, we are specializing in uh, data protection questions, including um, compliance, like for new technologies with the GDPR, but also investigations from data protection authorities. IP, IP contracts, IP litigation, and on the IT side, we are assisting clients with their digitalization projects, cybersecurity, and new technologies like artificial intelligence, the topic of today. Um, on the new EU regulation, um, it has come out in, in April this year, and I think um, if you want uh, to summarize it very briefly, um, we can say there are three big buckets of uh, technology that has to be, have to be looked at. It's unacceptable risk AI systems, which will be forbidden if the regulation comes into force. Um, this is, uh, for instance, um, all forms of social scoring uh, would be one example that would be forbidden. High risk AI systems, um, which are uh, which will be high the highest subject to the highest regulations under the new regulation and the highest set of rules. And what does this cover? It's, for instance, the evaluation of consumer creditworthiness or um, um, systems using biometric identification. Um, that that are examples of high risk AI systems. And then there uh, is the third bucket, which is the limited and minimal risk AI systems that are, for instance, AI chatbots. Um, those will be covered by, by these rules, which are, so we will see the, the regulation applies the principle of proportionality and depending on which system um, you want to deploy, either as a manufacturer or as a user of AI, um, uh, there are different sets of rules that have to be complied with um, across across um, the use of such technologies. Um, that's maybe on the on the EU uh, legislative approach. Uh, Emma, do you want me to expand also on US and Chinese initiatives? <laughs> that would be excellent. <laughs> Thank you. So I think. Um, the I, Chinese is probably, when it comes to uh, harmonized regulation, the oldest one. Um, it, uh, it has been a, a national plan for, uh, to regulate artificial intelligence uh, back in 2017. And um, basically the initiatives um, covered there were really, uh, the aim was to foster the development of uh, AI um, and not so much to regulate it. The goal of this uh, plan was also to um, set targets for the to be achieved by 2025 and uh, for instance to implement um, uh, specific regulations to uh, regulate the use of um, AI and the ultimate goal of the Chinese initiatives is to have by 2030 China as being the world's center of excellence of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, 
And um, in July this year, one, the first national set of rules came out in uh, Shenzhen. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. It's the equivalent of uh, the Silicon Valley in the US uh, for, uh, for China. And, um, and um, those have been submitted now to the Chinese Congress for, early, um, for, uh, for a review. Um, in the US also, and you will see uh, if you look at the dates, uh, 2020 and 2021 have been very popular years for regulating AI on a more harmonized level. Um, the US has also said uh, in the, the Federal Trade Commission has issued guidelines in April 2020 on uh, the use of AI technologies. Um, which have been um, again uh, reiterated with a more detailed set of rules in, in April this year. And I, I'm not going to go into the details of each and every piece of this uh, of these regulations, but I think we can have uh, we can identify a common set of themes which all of these regulations aim to target. So it's transparency towards users. Um, performance of impact assessments. Sometimes these rules come from the artificial intelligence regulations themselves, and sometimes they're even enhanced by data protection laws, uh, which come on top of AI regulation, and also in, uh, in, uh, require impact assessments when you use data which relate to an individual. Um, then there are the accountability principles. Um, so identify the risk, the risk of discrimination, the risk of um, uh, the AI developing um, bias uh, and therefore um, causing harm to individuals and also obviously important a continuous review of the AI systems post-marketing. So those are maybe the common themes in, in the three pieces of legislation, EU, US and uh, China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. We now have Eva, who, Eva Kali, who's managed to join us. Thank you so much for joining us, Eva. Um, would you like to, Eva Kali is the chair of the Future of Science and Technology Panel European Parliament and a real friend of the Institute of AI, so thank you. Um, I had posed the question to you, how quickly is AI moving towards deep and unsupervised learning? And what regulatory framework should be put in place to manage its development? for the benefit of industry and society. And this seemed like a, a really broad question for you, particularly because of your role within the European Parliament. If you can give us, you know, introduce yourself and then give us your thoughts, that would be much appreciated. So first of all, thank you for having me. It's a very timely debate. And actually this is exactly what we are planning to work on. It's uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, that uh, will deal with issues like the one that you mentioned. Uh, trying to have the benefits of AI and uh, make sure we will uh, protect citizens from the um, uh, implications that AI systems could have uh, in terms of uh, fundamental rights violations and, of course, for harmful artificial intelligence. So, of course, we, uh, we see uh, extremely rapid developments and transformation of uh, uh, AI, not just towards uh, deep and unsupervised learning, but in general. And the regulatory framework usually um, uh, is a bit late because innovation is always a, an effort to try to think out of the box. And we should allow enough room uh, for it to happen and develop. But we have to have a close look at how it develops and how it progresses and make sure we will intervene when that is possible. What is very interesting with the Artificial Intelligence Act and the approach that we are planning to have is that we don't try to stick into a very uh, specific uh, framework. We try to have a dynamic framework that will allow artificial intelligence to develop and we will also be able to have a definition that could change, which means um, if you start talking about artificial intelligence, you can talk about aut automation, but you can also talk about autonomous systems and you can also talk about super intelligence, which is uh, the point where AI is not being understandable by um, the, um, um, the computer scientists themselves, the programmers. Um, so um, I think that it's very important for us to, to make sure that uh, we will allow unsupervised 
learning uh, it, it's similar to the way humans learn about the world they they explore and they try to um uh, to remove any uh, specific roadmaps in order to um uh, to explore further and extend the the pool of data that they can access so i would say one of the fundamental advantages is that there were um there are always more unlabeled data than labeled um, in this world. So I think um, it would be very interesting and, and we saw that it has an, a transformative impact in natural uh, language uh, processing. Um, for example, there is a, an architecture known as uh, the transformer that was used by, by Google and it really allowed a lot of progress to take place. Uh, but um, this is mainly for more, uh, I would say, abstract uh, purposes. And um, I would suggest that we need definitely to have an understanding of what and how we should control it. So the regulatory framework should be dynamic and flexible, um, given the nonlinear nature of algorithms, but also to allow extensive use of sandboxes and, um, and delegated acts. And also we need to have expert-driven um, uh, developments. We need to have a supervisory authority, an independent one that will be able to have access so there will be enough transparency and explainability of the process in case the results are used in a non-acceptable way. Um, I would also say that we need to remain human-centric. You know that this is the principle of, of uh, um, deploying artificial intelligence in Europe, UK, um, for example, uh, said that human oversight is not necessary for AI systems, so this is a different approach. Um, and we have to ensure that there will be auditability, technical and ethical terms, and we also be able to, to review um, uh, our uh, AI Act uh, periodically by, by this independent board to see how it develops. So during the whole life cycle of an AI system, because what usually happens, even with GDPR, is we are informed and we are um, checking once there is a problem. Here we have to have a constant monitoring and also because the AI systems change themselves, we have to be able to follow it very closely, but also allow room uh, for it to develop and, and give us amazing um, solutions and, um, and even results. Thank you very much, Eva. That was, that was great. Um, Karolina Most Mostovic, apologies if I pronounced your, mispronounced your surname, you're the Deputy Head of Data Protection Unit in the, in the European Commission, and, and the question I'd pose to you was what lessons can be learned from the implementation of GDPR when developing the EU AI regulation, and I suppose I'd just add to that, Eva has, has spoken about you know, the need for a dynamic framework, and my background has been in policy and, and redrafting UK legislation and, I rem and, a, and a telco background. And I remember in, you know, with the European regulatory framework in telco, we adopted a technology neutral approach uh, and didn't realize the convergence that would happen and actually platform providers would essentially perform the role of a telco at the time. And so my question to you, when, you know, really appreciate your thoughts on, on the lessons to be learned from GDPR and whether a dynamic framework goes far enough or whether, whether we need to think about other things we need to pull through. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, for, for the question. And I think I will be able in answering the question to build up on what, um, what also already said, which elements were on, on which elements can we build um, using the experience we have looking at the GDPR enforcement? Let me start with uh, not only enforcement, but the, the pillars on which the GDPR rests, namely technologically neutral set framework, which precisely allows for what, uh, what you just mentioned, this dynamic framework, providing for some um, frames, but channels, but not uh, precluding a priori certain technologies. And on which the GDPR is based and which we are fostering now, what was also already uh, underlined today, 
it's this creation of trust, excellence, trust, and how do we achieve it? So all the set of uh, information obligations and the experience we gained with the relevance of information, how to provide it, how to verify what is an appropriate level of information, what is uh, sufficient, what is um, um, what is intelligible for the recipient. Uh, these are the, the, the elements which we used in, uh, in the development of the proposal of the artificial uh, intelligence legislation. And of course, um, coming back to the frame, technologically neutral channeling, but all the set of legal certainty and harmonization of the rules. Now, more enforcement, enforcement, sense of strictum. So uh, how do we enforce GDPR and whether the fact that, uh, and it was also underlined today, that there is such a big overlap between, um, or, or there will be a complementarity in the application between the e privacy uh, between the um, artificial intelligence regulation and the gdpr uh, because we are still talking here about um, personal data so how it all how it all will work with uh, um uh, national data protection authorities with this famous one-stop shop under the the gdpr and a different governance system in the ai so, um, um, well, there is, uh, there is never um, uh, uh, one fit all solution and uh, um, artificial intelligence can have very different uh, applications. So financial sector, medical sector, or uh, uh, law enforcement. Therefore, artificial intelligence proposal gives um, member states um, more uh, flexibility in establishing, in designating one or more uh, supervisory authorities. And indeed, sometimes the supervisory authorities will be data protection authorities. Um, this, this leaves uh, the flexibility, allows for, um, for the dynamic uh, framework, also from the point of view of enforcement, and uh, uh, takes into account uh, diverse fields of uh, artificial intelligence applications. Then we have a construction of the board where one can also see certain parallelism and lessons le learned from the GDPR enforcement. This board, Art European Artificial Intelligence Board, is set up in a different way than it's the case by the European Data Protection Board. And uh, um, uh, parts of it are the national authorities then uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor and uh, the Commission. And um, here the, the, the role of the Commission will be a different one than it's the case in the uh, European Data Protection Board. Um, what could I add to this lessons learned? We have seen that uh, the idea of the risk-based approach, the idea of accountability um, allows for uh, matched with uh, this technology, uh, te uh, this uh, technology neutral approach gives uh, good results, but by, and here I'm, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but by framing, but not precluding innovation and, uh, and uh, new deployments of the technologies uh, which, um, which we see upcoming. And this, uh, this uh, mindsetting of creating an environment of uh, human-centric um, and trustful um, uh, setting uh, seems to uh, to work, and um, yeah, this is what is really um, even in the distinction between the two, three different kinds of artificial uh, in, uh, intelligence uh, uh, systems. 
high uh, limited and minimum uh, is very visible. Certain decisions are already taken up front by the legislator, but idea, this, this risk-based approach so much anchored in the GDPR is, um, uh, is, is precisely um, is precisely that. I, um, I'm, I, I think I, I uh, was supposed to be very short and to focus on this enforcement aspects and matching with the GDPR, what I hope I have done, but um, please let me know if you would like to, that I address something more precisely. No, that was excellent, thank you. And, and finally, Christiane, you've waited very patiently, thank you. I, I had posed the question to you around how should the complex mechanisms of algorithms be communicated to consumers in order to achieve consent, but I think we can also draw out this point about trust. And based on my conversation with you last week, I suspect you have a different view around some of the, you know, the benefits of dynamic systems as opposed to harder law. Um, if you'd like to, you know, take the floor. Yeah, thank you so much. And first of all, thanks so much to the organizers for having me on this panel. And thank you, Emma, for raising the consumer aspect, which I believe is a very important aspect. First, a couple of sentences about myself. I'm a professor of law at Vienna University, and I have been dealing with topics such as IoT, data, and AI for a number of years now. Inter alia, I was co-chair of the Data Ethics Commission advising the German government, uh, a member of the Commission Expert Group on Liability and New Technologies, and I'm now also working on the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, inter alia. I've uh, authored a study for the European Parliament on biometric recognition and behavioral detection, and now another study for the Austrian Ministry of Social Affairs on consumer aspects. And it is precisely those consumer aspects which I believe we need to focus upon over the coming months, because I'm not sure the consumer perspective has been fully taken into account. Um, luckily, consumers can rely on a very strong framework in the GDPR already. Now, when it comes to automated decision making, we have Article 22 of the GDPR. So, uh, consumers are protected where um, an automated decision uh, has legal effect for them or similarly significantly affects the consumer. So, there are minimum rights. There is a right to receive an explanation. Uh, there are rights, you know, to have particular safeguards in place, including a right to contest the decision, a right to receive uh, human intervention if necessary. And I think that is extremely important and that should be stressed also in the context of the AI regulation, because in a number of contexts, uh, we may have to go a couple of steps further. For example, the GDPR um, Article 22 only covers fully automated decisions where we have no uh, meaningful human intervention and we may wish to go one step further and also include recommender systems, for example, that are getting increasingly important in the consumer field. Now, Emma, you, you asked me specifically about consent, and I think um, consent is a very important, but also a very problematic and difficult concept. Um, consent, in order to make sense for consumers and for citizens in general, um, needs to be meaningful. And the way consent is um, being used at the moment is not always meaningful. I think I don't have to say we all click OK buttons um, a million times. We have no idea to whom we have given consent. There is no documentation. There is no way for us to follow this up. There is often no way to properly understand what's going on with our data and what's happening with algorithmic decision making. And so I think that has to be a focus for policymakers over the coming years. Um, certainly, we need to focus on the way how information is provided. So we must make sure uh, there's more standardization. We make uh, more use of icons. We make more use of color schemes and so on. But I'm afraid that will not be sufficient. I'm afraid um, we uh, uh, need also to have 
uh, technology in place, technology that assists consumers in dealing with consent, in managing their consent. So um, that's certainly something we have to focus upon. We need to empower consumers with the help of technology. We also need new intermediaries in place, intermediaries that assist consumers, support consumers in uh, uh, making sure consent is given for the applications they want to consent to. So I think this must be a focus uh, uh, over the coming months and years to ensure that consent is meaningful. And Emma, thank you so much for mentioning that um, I would also like to go a step further. And um, I'm delighted to see that the proposal for an AI Act is uh, making steps uh, uh, in that direction. I think uh, uh, we need to set substantive limits. It, it's not just uh, enough to say, you know, we have certain procedures, how you get to consent, that consent must be free, informed, and so on. Um, we must have substantive limits. There must be something which I like to call unfair algorithmic practices that are simply banned and prohibited. Uh, unfair data practices that are simply banned and prohibited. And I see uh, with a degree of delight that the AI Act proposal is now going in that direction, that there is a very short list, of course, but there is a list of prohibited AI practices. And I think that's really uh, the way uh, uh, forward to have clear red lines. And um, now, of course, taking again the consumer perspective, Article 20, uh, Article 5 of the proposal as it stands now does not really take consumer interests into account. I understand there are good reasons for that because that is to a certain extent covered by the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive and other legislation. But I think uh, that should be extended to meet consumer interests. For example, where we have very targeted exploitation of individual vulnerabilities of consumers that have become visible by way of data collection and data analytics. I think that must be uh, included in the list of Article 5. Article 5 shouldn't be restricted just to physical and psychological harm. I think we need to take the consumer perspective into account there. And I would also suggest to take the consumer uh, perspective into account uh, when it comes to possibly extending the, the Annex 3 on high-risk applications. So um, I, I think we need to make use of those coming months of the uh, negotiations of the, about, of the debates about the AI Act, which is a, a brilliant piece of legislation. I'm, I'm very happy to see this and, and make sure the consumer perspective is properly taken into account. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christiane. And it seems like uh, quite a while, actually, since Marco spoke. Um, my, a question that, that strikes me is that can we adopt national or supranational approaches in the regulation of AI, or do we need greater international, uh, a greater international approach? And in, our, in my discussions as, as the kind of the director of the institute, we have had conversations with um, African countries and the African Development Bank, for example, and they gave us the feedback that actually the, the EU GDPR is a gold standard for data protection. However, their data economy is not developed enough. They do not want to, to be, you know, to, to be burdened with a very heavy regulatory environment when their data economy is still to develop. And I, I wondered if I could speak, ask Mark a question around your view whether there needs to be greater coordination, you know, greater coordination at an international level, and what the risks are from an industrial strategy approach if we are too heavy. With the regulation. Yes, thank you for that question because it's a it's it's a very interesting one because um I think there is a, a twofold approach. On the first hand, we are in an international competitive um, sphere, which means that we are not competing with countries. We are competing with actually more um, regions, and we are competing with um, um, companies. What I mean by that is. I have been to the Silicon Valley last week. I just landed on, on Saturday morning, and we have been to a lot of companies, as as it always is when there is governmental um, um, trips over there. And what you can see is that there is an ecosystem on a very confined space, and that's the same with Shenzhen. There is a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of bright minds, but a lot of bright ideas, 
and they are focused on, on a single ecosystem on a tight space. In Europe, we don't have that. We have a small ecosystem in Berlin, we have a small ecosystem in Paris, and you can mention Sweden, Italy, and all the other countries. And if I want to set up an ecosystem that competes with either Shenzhen, I take that as a part, for the whole China, um, um, for the whole country to China, and the Silicon Valley, then you need to have this focused tight space. But we will not be able to make that um, because of the Europe, how the European Union works, how national states work, and how um, um, this an ecosystem works. So what we need to do is setting up kind of a digital ecosystem to compete there for AI and for data-driven applications, but for other technologies of the future too. What in Germany we took two we took two measures to um, to kind of foster that. The first was the initiative Gaia X, which is um, in my department too, to kind of set up something like an common shared um, ecosystem of trust and excellence when it comes to cloud services and cloud uh, relations and data relations amongst um, companies, citizens and companies um, from abroad. And the second thing is we need to, we need to um, Europeanize our national strategies. And by Europeanize, I mean that we work together. And I see that in a lot of um, issues at the moment. For example, when it comes to the IPCEI, I hope everybody knows what it is. It's an important project of common European interest, which is like a funding scheme for certain technologies. And you can see that with um, cloud, you can see an IPCI microelectronics, and we will see an IPCI for um, um, 5G, 6G, maybe two. And this means that we Europeanize the approach towards strategy and, and, and towards technologies. And this is of utmost importance if you want to compete, because it's not one national state. Even a large one like Germany is not able to conquer the world of AI by themselves. And we are in, in the end, and that's my closing remark, we are competing not with companies. We are competing with spheres of and, and ecosystems of innovation. And, and, and Ava, do you have any comments to add? If, if you allow me just to compliment, just add to Mark uh, a little bit uh, the European domain sure. dimension here. The, precisely, therefore, the European regulation, the precisely, therefore, full harmonization of the conditions within the EU, and precisely, therefore, our EU's leadership role as far as, uh, as protection of personal data and uh, regulation of artificial in intelligence, is concerned, and I think that uh, in particular in the area of data protection, I think we are setting the standard in the world, so which will help and foster the position of the EU and the European companies in the regions, as uh, Marco just uh, underlined. So um, I, I don't think we can do it without the harmonization and setting uh, and, uh, and, and uh, agreeing on common standards in the EU. And I was just going to ask Eva, if from from a MAP, you know, a, a member of the European Parliament, whether she had any views on this and how she thought European Parliament could assist in that in, with that approach. Well, first of all, already by having an artificial intelligence act at the European level means we are trying to be um, fast enough to avoid the friction of having. 27 different member states' national strategies. We already see some strategies. We try to make sure we will be, we will embed and we will harmonize the environment um, to avoid having a fragmented market again, as this is a technology that goes beyond border. It's a, um, it's a global technology. And I think that setting up the digital innovation hubs, we are also trying to create a European network of ecosystems because we have different languages. It's not just different member states. Um, different uh, legal and tax systems and of course we need to have a harmonized uh, uh, single uh, European digital market in order to see more achievements to take place uh, but also we have to understand the different nature of this European Union in comparison to US and, and China that they, uh, they, they don't face uh, uh, similar challenges. Um, also I believe that since um, uh, trust and excellence uh, is uh, and human-centric artificial intelligence is at the core of what we want. We need to understand that we need to lead uh, with these characteristics and we don't just need to see the numbers of China or US. Um, this means we need to respect fundamental rights. We need to find the balances between privacy and safety in artificial intelligence, which is really challenged in, in China. I think nobody wants to have uh, a world of the black 
superior uh, social ranking um, experiment. Um, so uh, it's very important to understand how this AI Act will develop because already we voted that we don't want facial recognition in public spaces. Um, we we are uh, we have to decide what is going to be included in the high risk applications. And again, this is going to be a dynamic approach, which means it's going to change. And this would also be a responsibility for anybody, not just being in the EU, but also acting in EU. Uh, so the, there has to be a reciprocity with not just us, but all, not just the uh, like-minded, let's say, allies of ours, that we can agree in common standards, as Caroline also mentioned, uh, but we definitely need to, to extend our influence to not like-minded countries and agree at the basics in order to allow these um, technologies and its application to um, to work and access our market. I think this is important. and. Um, and, and I don't like to make this comparison constantly of, you know, unicorns or like just numbers, because if you would have to choose a place to live, I think you still would choose Europe. Um, I'm biased, but I, but I, this is my feeling. Um, so in the end, um, I believe that our strategy and uh, also the, TTC, the TTP uh, effort, so the um, the, the, the effort now to have a trade and technology alliance with uh, um, with US is moving towards the, say, the the right direction. So we try to um, to agree on the minimum standards and the minimum requirements for AI systems to develop in general in technologies. Um, I think this would be very important because this would help us also lead the way into regulating. Um, not just technologies, but the, the internet itself, which we haven't done the last basically 20 years. And this would complement the puzzle of the DSA, the DMA, the Digital Finance, so AI Act and then the Data Act, who will also give the standards for the exchange of industrial data between um, uh, businesses would really be important because then they will have the legal certainty of what they can share, what they should share, and giving access to data improves the quality also of the applications and this means people can trust it even more they can feel they are reliable and more people will use it so um i'm quite optimistic for uh, for our efforts and i don't think we will create you know, more friction actually we will remove friction and fragmentation thank you catherine um i'm oh, sorry mark would you want to add to that thank you just one short sentence because it, i think it's of utmost importance um, especially when compared to the GDPR. Um, whatever the regulation that's coming out of the European process will be, it needs to be practicable for small and medium enterprises and not only for the big companies, because that's what we've seen up to now with European regulation, that sometimes, or most of the times, the big companies, be them from Europe or be them from abroad, are way easier to adapt them than the small and medium enterprises. And this is, we, we, will, go and be, we will need the small and medium enterprises to set up this ecosystem I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, I was going to pick that point up. But this with, didn't happen with uh, GDPR. Sorry, just just everybody thought it would be impossible, but it, it, it didn't become impossible for SMEs. So so that, that's just a comment. I'm not sure Catherine and I might agree with you. Uh, I still bear the war wounds of implementing GDPR for clients. But Carolina, what did you want to what did you want to add on that? Well, there is all this um, the flexibility. Everybody wants to flow the flexibility and then everybody wants to have legal certainty. Yeah, And this is precisely the trade-off where we are. This uh, legal certainty for small and medium-sized enterprises, you do this A, B, C, and it's right. It gives the security, but it frames very much. There is no flexibility and there is no risk-based approach. It's very difficult to find a correct balance how to passion the smaller ones who do not have maybe sufficient uh, uh, legal expertise, but where actually the development in Europe is coming from. Because the development and the, the, uh, the, 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 the really who makes business in Europe are small and medium-sized enterprises, and they do need these flexibilities. So uh, how to do it? How to, uh, how to allow them to enjoy the flexibility and the risk-based approaches of this earth? but still sufficiently legal, uh, with, uh, with, with this legal certainty, which cuts down on the implementation costs. And I think this is what Marco was talking about. 
Well, we thought in GDPR we were able to match it with uh, flexibility and support and uh, really this leading a little bit more by the hand by data protection authorities. It, sometimes it works, sometimes less. I, I think it's, um, it's always this um, dangers of freedom, but um, it's easy to say when, when, uh, when one um, does not do the stuff on the, on, on the ground probably. And this is something that we are very much considering and uh, uh, taking into account, but precisely this balance, flexibility, legal certainty, freedom, but, but cautioned freedom. Brilliant, thank you. And, and this point I'd really like to, to bring up with Catherine and Christiane actually, and ask Catherine to offer her view around the legal certainty from a client perspective, from a corporate perspective, but also whether there is legal certainty for, consu for consumers. Because when I apply my kind of, you know, my understanding of GDPR when I'm advising clients is very different to how um, I wish to enforce my rights as a consumer. So Catherine, do you want to, to offer your views and then I'll pass over to Christiane? Yeah, happy to. So maybe first, um, I respectfully disagree that it's easy for big and international and mid-sized companies to implement GDPR or any of the other regulations. <laughs> I have uh, quite some uh, different experience um, with them, even with the best efforts that they want to implement uh, it in a correct way. Um, it is not always easy. And I, I totally understand that we need technology neutral, flexible uh, rules. Um, but then I think what we now see with GDPR, for instance, and that is where the flexibility ends very harshly, is um, if we are in areas where you do not have yet all the guidance, like for instance, on how if you want to base your processing on legitimate interest and not consent. <clears throat> Sorry. The problem is then you as a company do a legitimate interest balancing test as it's foreseen by the GDPR. You do the information of the users and everything. You think you did a good job. And then what is then the outcome when the authority just says, I do not agree with your legitimate interest balancing test. I have another view. And I think that is the point where it becomes extremely difficult for companies to navigate these rules because we do also need a standard of review then. Should the authority be able to just replace the assessment? If we look at accountability, um, this is the obvious thing. Companies must think and document how they comply with the rules that are set out in the GDPR or, or, or then uh, later in the and then what is the standard of review of when you complied with it? Can the authority just say, I don't agree. I, I have a different view. Um, and then there is no legal certainty anymore if you don't have specific guidance on how to perform the alleged interest uh, balancing test, if there are processing activities which are excluded plainly from LI, legitimate interest as a legal basis. So all of these things, um, and I know that there's guidance then from uh, either local authorities or on a European level from the European Data Protection Board for the GDPR again. But even there you have inconsistencies. Sometimes um, um, it's very difficult to navigate this minefield if, as a company if you are active in many several different company, uh, countries. And then this is just EU. If you then have to take into account the rules in China and in the US for Chinese uh, rules, I think uh, very recently in July, they have issued the new Data Security Act where the default is consent, which is not exactly the same rule as in, um, in Europe. So I think uh, it is a bit uh, a difficult thing. And on the, con on the protection of the users, I know that, um, Christiane, you have been very much focusing on consent as being the ideal solution for um, allowing, uh, that was my understanding, or at least you said if consent is used, it has to be very clear and user friendly, maybe then I misunderstood, but I let you uh, explain what you thought and I will just say my view on consent is um, it is something which uh, regulators too easily say you should have used consent instead of legitimate interest. Um, and then the question is, is this really a more protective tool? Um, if you look at the digital context, many services 
um, need personal data, then individuals receive multiple consent requests. They have to cl click through and swipe, toggle, whatever, uh, multiple times to be able to access a, a service. Um, and somehow it's the burden of deciding whether this processing is in their interest or not um, very much pushed on the user with limited info wording because of the possibility to give clear and precise and concise information. Or is there not uh, an alternative con to consent like legitimate interest? More protective because they're the whole burden is on the company. Sorry, that was it. I stop here. <laughs> no, it's okay. I just think I'm just trying to bring it back to, you know, to the, to the, to the artificial intelligence. And it's this point, isn't it, that, that some of these lessons around the, 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 the teething problems with GDPR, we, we risk possibly replicating in AI, for the AI regulation, yeah. and whether that then acts as a barrier for, for innovation or not. But Christiane, do you want to, I know we've only got four minutes left, so I can just pick up your thoughts and then I'll ask the panel to give their, their kind of final comments. Yeah, thank you so much. So, so just to clarify with Catherine on, on consent, my point is not to overestimate consent. Consent is a problematic uh, legal ground for both sides, in fact. It's, it's problematic for the individual data subject or citizen or consumer, how you want to name it, and it's problematic for the business. So when I advise businesses, I always tell them, you know, don't overestimate uh, consent. It's also problematic for you and I think to a certain extent uh, we need and this is the point I really wanted to make uh, we, we really need to think about substantive limits mandatory uh, limits which you cannot and, and have more liberty otherwise I think that would be the better approach both for businesses and for consumers but to come back to to, to Emma's question um, about also certainty for consumers I think um, as a lawyer, we tend to believe everything should be solved by way of regulation, but, but that is evidently not the case. So we need a multi-level governance approach to AI and all these digital phenomena. So we need to look at, you know, uh, society, we need to look at education, we need to look at technology, we need to create technology that empowers citizens, that empowers consumers, that makes sure uh, we have strong fundamental rights protection. We need to look at the economy, so creating the right incentives so that there is a market for trustworthy AI. You know, these are all different levels which we have to uh, focus on. So I think a multi-level governance approach is really what is required uh, in that regard. And um, looking at, at that, we only have two minutes uh, left. I will leave it here. Thank you. Um, so I will thank everyone because I think this is now a, a, a drop, you know, a, a drops off completely. And thank everyone for listening and thank you for the panelists for such a lively discussion. Eva, Eva, do you want to give some kind of your your a sentence of final comments, pass to Marco and pass around the panel um, and see where we get to? Well, I could definitely say that uh, we are trying to be, uh, now we are more geopolitical. Uh, so this means we are not just looking what EU is doing, but we are trying to see our position uh, between uh, the biggest uh, countries. So I think that we will in the end have a balanced approach for AI Act. And I think the Data Act, which will be basically the GDPR for industrial data, will be able to allow and release more data, also public generated data. And let's not forget that we have GDPR as a principle based approach and not constantly being monitored. So um, I understand the challenges, but if by the mindset by design changes and we have this legal certainty that our effort, the legislative uh, effort is trying to, to present, I think then things will become more easy. So you don't have to go back and change your systems, but you have it included by, by design. And also, this is also what I think about consent. I think by design, we have to have safe and trusted applications. And of course, then give options and ask consent of the citizens. But how when you go in the European market and you, you buy a medicine, you understand that you can trust it. I think the same needs to happen also in the internet. And this is the benefit of the European market. Um, so I'm uh, more optimistic about the future because I think with the pandemic, we realize the possibilities and we don't start our sentence for artificial intelligence like I'm afraid that. So this changed. 
and we see the potential of it and um, now it's the time also to set set the right rules and this just started so it's excellent to discuss and understand also the um, uh, the concerns and make sure we will address them so I hope we will be able to remain in touch while we will be drafting this uh, legislative uh, file thank you so much thank you and sorry we couldn't take final comments from anyone else but thank you all for listening we finish are we dropping off Oh, I'm still live. Apologies. Right. Mark, how, how long do we still have for final comments? You're watching the clicker going down. Mark, do you want to give your final comments, please? Okay. Yes. My final comment would be, um, I'm, we, are embracing, we are embracing the regulation and we are embracing the thought of excellence and trust. But um, coming from the United States, I can only um, warn from um, a perspective I have heard there that this is Europe sets another point, uh, a regulation in motion, which has 800 pages and then Others in the United States will get do some cherry picking. We'll shorten it to 20 pages, and then we will will be um, regulatory way more competitive than we are, and still attract our minds, our people, and our ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Well, what can I say? I'm all for good regulation and better regulation. <laughs> this is what we are trying to do. Thank you. And, um, uh, Catherine. Yeah, but listening to all the comments, the use of different legal bases, because, you know, it's my home, GDPR, so I'm coming always back uh, uh, to it. Uh, I, 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 see, I'm, I'm, I, I see always this, this striving between give us freedom, we will know, we will try, because otherwise you stifle innovation. And then on the other hand, whoa, it's so unsecure, what I'm supposed to do with it? I leave it there, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Christiane, Catherine, do you have any final comments before we hand back over? Well, well, just, just maybe to say, I think it was so important for the EU to move forward and to put this AI regulation proposal on the table. I think it's so important that this step was taken and I, I fully support it. And of course, now the institutions have to use the, the coming months and years to really get it right. But I think that was absolutely the right step at absolutely the right point in time. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I was uh, not uh, aiming to criticize EU regulation as a whole. I'm, I think the set, the, the set of framing that we have is important and uh, extremely helpful. Um, on the AI regulation, um, with a little bit more tweaks and feedback maybe from businesses, it will be a very excellent uh, regulation and I think it's important to have it to be competitive and uh, have a clear set of rules. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, and thanks um, for, for listening. <laughs>